Everybody always says going back to the well like it's a bad thing. Oh, another Borg episode. They're going back to the well again. But in real life, the well is where you get the water. Going back to the well is a good thing, a necessary thing. So why shouldn't we go back to the well? I think I just channeled a Voyager creative meeting. This is a review of the two-part Star Trek Voyager episode Unimatrix Zero. If you have not seen this episode and you don't want to know what happens in it, be warned, spoilers beyond this point. You know, there's a scene relatively early in part one of this episode where the senior officers are having a meeting and talking about what they're going to do, and Tom Paris goes, another round with the Borg? And on my couch, watching, I'm like, buddy, I am right there with you. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. The episode opens on the Borg Queen dealing with a personnel issue. It seems some drones have been afflicted with a mutation that does something bad. We don't really know yet. The Queen questions such an afflicted drone about this, but the drone says he knows nothing. So the Queen turns to the other drones like, off with his head. Actually, what she says is, bring me his cortical array. And that's the line we go to the opening credits on. Gotta love that scintillating dialogue, always one of the hallmarks of Star Trek Voyager. Anyway, after the credits, we find Seven of Nine wandering through a wooded area. She hears someone call her human name, Annika, and then wakes up in her regeneration alcove. Apparently, it was all a dream. Seven goes to the doctor like, but I don't want to have dreams. And the doctor says, oh, you'll get used to it. Later on, she has another dream, and she talks to the guy who said her name. His name is Axum, and he tells her this isn't a dream. This is Unimatrix Zero. And again, we cut to commercial on a bit of flat techno babble because I guess it worked so well the first time. It turns out Unimatrix Zero is a kind of virtual reality environment that certain Borg drones can enter while they're in their regeneration cycle. Only drones with a particular genetic mutation are able to access it. The visitors to Unimatrix Zero exist in the real world on Borg cubes located throughout the galaxy, but they can come together and interact with each other in this simulated space. So it's like Decentraland, only there are people in it. And those people are Borg drones instead of Crypto Bros, which I imagine makes it a far more pleasant experience. Drones who enter Unimatrix Zero have no memory of it once their regeneration cycle ends, but they do remember their lives in Unimatrix Zero when they are there. It turns out Seven of Nine was a regular visitor for many years until she was disconnected from the Collective by Voyager a few years ago. But now, Axum has tracked her down and brought her back to Unimatrix Zero, because the Borg Queen has found out about their little VR clubhouse and is trying to shut it down. Axum and the others have a solution, a nanovirus that can prevent the Queen from detecting the genetic mutation that allows drones to access Unimatrix Zero. But since they all turn back into drones when they wake up from regeneration, they need someone from outside the Collective to introduce the virus. That's where Seven comes in. Seven tells Janeway about Axum's plan and says they should treat it like any other distress call and do what they can to help. But Janeway wants some more info first, so she has Tuvok do a three-way mind meld with her and Seven so Janeway can visit Unimatrix Zero too. She meets with Axum and says, your nanovirus plan is good and we can help you continue to hide here, but have you considered greatly increasing the risk to all your lives instead? Janeway's suggestion is to find a way for the drones of Unimatrix Zero to retain their individuality once they wake up, so that they can form a resistance movement and start to undermine the collective from within. Axum's like, that's ambitious, but I'm not really sure. Great, it's a deal! The doctor takes Axum's nanovirus and modifies it so that drones with the mutation will retain their individuality once they wake up from regeneration. They locate a nearby Borg cube and hatch a scheme to get aboard and introduce the virus so that it will spread throughout the entire collective. The Borg Queen learns of Janeway's involvement and, suspecting she's up to something, makes a threatening phone call to Voyager, telling Janeway to mind her own business. Janeway's like, that's not really my thing, and they proceed with the plan, which is this. Voyager attacks the nearby Borg cube while Janeway, Tuvok, and Balana move in close aboard the Delta Flyer and beam aboard. 
that part works okay. The Delta Flyer is destroyed, but don't worry, they build another one off screen a few episodes later. It's no problem because nothing matters. Then, once they're aboard the cube, Janeway, Tuvok, and Balana are assimilated. And it turns out that was part of the plan, so that part works okay too. By the way, have the Borg upped their assimilation game or what? We see Janeway, Tuvok, and Balana take those little tubes to the neck. There's one brief cutaway to Voyager as Chakotay orders a retreat. Then we're back aboard the cube, and Janeway, Tuvok, and Balana are fully Borgified. At first I thought there was a time jump or something, but no. In part two, dialogue between Chakotay and Paris establishes that the away team is only on the cube for a few hours. Those nanoprobes must have been busting their teensy little asses, huh? As part two begins, Janeway, Tuvok, and Balana are still on the Borg cube, because it's only been a couple of minutes, fully assimilated as drones, but able to retain their individuality thanks to an anti-Borg vaccine the doctor gave them all before they left. But uh-oh, Tuvok's vaccine is wearing off and he keeps hearing the voice of the Collective intruding into his thoughts. One of those times, the Borg Queen briefly hears Tuvok and realizes what's going on. She figures out which cube the away team is on and has some drones capture them, but not before Balana is able to deliver the nanovirus by injecting it into the core of the cube using her little wrist tubes. If they're not actually part of the Collective, how does she know how to work the little wrist tubes? And how did the nanovirus get into the wrist tubes for Balana to send it into the cube? Did the doctor infect Balana with the virus and then after she was assimilated, she was somehow able to locate the virus in her own body and shoot it through her little wrist tubes on command? How is any of this supposed to work? The drones put Janeway into a holographic whatchamacallit so she can talk to the Borg Queen, who says, Hey, I just thought you'd like to know all the suffering you've caused by injecting the Collective with that virus that allows the Unimatrix Zero drones to disconnect and remain individuals, you've left me no choice but to just blow up all the Borg vessels that have disconnected drones on them. Couldn't you just use other drones to find the disconnected ones? And reassimilate them or kill them if necessary? Nope, wouldn't work, gotta blow up the whole ship. And the Borg Queen starts blowing up her own ships. Hilariously, she tries to use this as leverage against Janeway. If you don't convince them to shut down Unimatrix Zero and rejoin the Collective, I'll keep destroying my own ships. Janeway's like, have we met? At the end of this season, I'm going to help my future self erase 25 years of history because it didn't turn out quite how I wanted it to. I do not give a shit. Meanwhile, in Unimatrix Zero, Borg drones have figured out a way to invade and capture the disconnected drones, so there's a kind of primitive frontier war going on. Also, it turns out Axum and Seven were a thing for a while, and he remembers, but she doesn't, so it's just weird. And then Janeway contacts Chakotay, ostensibly to relay the Borg Queen's demand that the disconnected drones in Unimatrix Zero rejoin the Collective, but Chakotay reads between the lines and realizes that Janeway is actually telling him to shut down Unimatrix Zero, so the Queen will have no way of finding the disconnected drones, who can now retain their individuality in the real world too, thanks to the nanovirus. Voyager and another Borg vessel commandeered by disconnected drones work to disrupt the frequency which carries Unimatrix Zero. All the remaining drones there leave. Seven says goodbye to Axum. The cube he is on is so far away, it's unlikely they'll ever see each other again. Meanwhile, the Borg Queen realizes what's going on and that she's about to lose her only remaining way to find the wayward drones. She turns to the hologram of Janeway like, what the hell, man? And Janeway says, I don't compromise with Borg. Except for that time a few years ago when I offered them an ultimate weapon in exchange for a right of way. Anyway, the Queen blows up the cube Janeway, Tuvok, and Balana are on, but Voyager beams them back just in time. They get deborgified. Unimatrix Zero is gone, but the drones that were part of it are still out there with their individuality intact, so they can carry on their resistance, which will alter the Borg Collective so dramatically that none of this is ever, ever mentioned again. This is pretty much the bottom of the barrel for me as far as the Borg are concerned. 
the episode attempts to tell a bloated, overly complicated story that doesn't make sense on multiple levels, carries no dramatic weight, and means nothing. The Borg have been completely bled dry of anything that made them menacing or interesting. There's no mystery left to them at all. There's nothing unique or intimidating about them. The Borg are just standard-issue bad guy aliens at this point. We see drones operating computers, pushing buttons. We've got the Borg Queen issuing verbal orders, watching things on monitors, making threatening calls to Janeway. I maintain that the Borg Queen is a fine character, or at least would have been if we'd only seen her in Star Trek First Contact. Her presence there makes sense and works, but like the Borg in general, the more the Queen shows up, the less impressive she is. Here, she comes across as out of the loop, incompetent, and easily outsmarted. The venomous but strangely seductive Serpent in the Garden character seen in First Contact is nowhere to be seen here. Worse yet, the Queen's continued presence, at least as depicted in this episode, only serves to further weaken the Borg as a whole. Instead of a collective consciousness composed of billions of minds all working in concert, we have the Queen, who can hear the voices of her drones, but also needs to ask for things to be brought to her, can be distracted without much effort, and is apparently completely unaware when assimilated drones don't join the collective, as is the case with Janeway, Tuvok, and Bellana, even though the Queen is watching at the moment they are assimilated. She watches them get assimilated, then doesn't notice that they aren't actually in the collective until Tuvok's anti-Borg shot starts to wear off. Speaking of the away team's assimilation, they gloss over something that should be a really big deal for the sake of giving the cliffhanger a shocking image to go out on, then stumble right before the finish line. Getting assimilated is part of Janeway's plan, but we aren't told that. We're supposed to think the away team is in big trouble at the end of part one, when all three of them have been Borgified, but Chakotay gives it away in the next-to-last scene when he says, so far so good, before ordering Paris to withdraw from the fight with the cube. Why have him say that? Why not have him say something like, let's get out of here, in a tense, serious tone that would make sense in hindsight once we know the deal, but doesn't give it away right before the end. Now that we know everything we've seen up to this point has gone according to plan, we don't feel a sense of peril for Janeway, Tuvok, and Bellana when we see them as drones because we know they are right where they want to be. Yes, they're in danger, they're surrounded by Borg, but they're still in control of themselves and carrying out their plan. And yes, the explanation for this we get in part two, that they aren't actually drones because the doctor gave them a shot off screen that blocks them from hooking up to the collective, completely removes the threat of being assimilated. Instead of a nightmare that some would rather die to avoid, it's just something else you can be inoculated against. No big deal. But even if that's the direction you're going, why let the cat out of the bag before the to be continued? Why not leave us in suspense, thinking that they've been assimilated and that all is lost? Isn't that a better cliffhanger? Seven's story isn't much better, which is too bad since it's supposedly the heart of the thing. The idea of giving her a past life that she's forgotten about is intriguing. Unimatrix Zero is a place she apparently enjoyed being. She formed strong relationships with other people there, and when she was removed from the Collective by the Voyager crew, she lost that and forgot all about those people. You'd think discovering that might cause some mixed feelings, but the episode isn't interested in that. The idea of Seven having a serious relationship with someone in the past who she's completely forgotten also has potential, but Axum just turns out to be Seven's version of Vedic Burial. He's not that interesting in his own right, and there's no chemistry between him and Seven. I'm supposed to be sad when they have to say goodbye for the last time, but I don't really care. Also, Janeway really doesn't come across well in this episode at all. 
She responds to the call for help from the drones of Unimatrix Zero, declines to do what they've asked her to do, take an action that would prevent their virtual sanctuary from being discovered, and takes it upon herself to do something else that will put those drones in even more danger. And which, if the Borg Queen had any idea what she was doing, would result in the almost instant death of all of the disconnected drones, on the off chance that they might be able to form a resistance to the collective from within. But did Axum or any of the others ever say that's what they wanted? We see them going along with it, but that's after Janeway has decided that's what she's going to do. I'm not saying the story shouldn't have pivoted from Axum's original idea to the let's free the Unimatrix Zero drones from the Collective plan, just that the way it's written makes Janeway look like a terrible person who sees an opportunity to enlist others in a revolution she herself won't have to fight in, and then does it before they have a chance to object. There are one or two good points scattered throughout this two-parter. I like the opening tracking shot of the Borg Queen's vessel. It's reminiscent of similar shots we've seen in the past without being an exact copy, and it does a good job of giving us a sense of the scale of the ship. There's a scene early in part one where Tom Paris learns he's being promoted to lieutenant when he finds a box at his duty station containing his new rank pip. And from across the bridge, Forever Ensign Harry says, I didn't notice a little box on my chair. That made me chuckle. Harry, that poor bastard. <laughs> but overall, there's not much of value here. The episode is Exhibit A for how Voyager wrecked the Borg by diluting or eliminating some of their most unique and formidable qualities, and also through sheer overuse. The irresistible evil can only be successfully resisted so many times before that resistance is futile line starts to ring hollow. If you compare the Borg here to their first appearance in TNG's Q Who, the change is immediately apparent and startling. What was once alien, unknowable, and seemingly unbeatable is now just another bunch of goons with shit glued to their faces. The Borg and Voyager are little more than Kazan in different costumes. There's no creative purpose for them to keep showing up. The Borg appear in Voyager as frequently as they do because they were a known quantity. They were the most recognizable villains of the TNG era probably the most recognizable villains of the entire franchise, with the possible exception of the Klingons. So, the creators of Voyager kept bringing them back. They had no new ideas, no fresh angles to explore, or if they did, they failed to actually explore them. The Borg became staples of Voyager because the show's writers and producers lacked the creativity or perhaps the creative freedom to come up with anything else, anything better. So what choice did they have but to keep going back to the well? The thing about going back to the well, though, there's not much use in it once that well has run dry. What good is it to keep bringing back the board when they've lost all the qualities that made them compelling to begin with? After a certain point, you're just pulling up buckets of dirt and calling it water. Look, this isn't an all-time worst episode or anything. It's not offensive or embarrassing. It's just a long way to go for very little. A cliffhanger with no tension, a one-parter stretched into a two-parter through posturing and plot contrivances. This tedious, busy, clunky, preposterous, emotionally flat episode shows us the Borg at their creative nadir and Voyager running on fumes. Those are my thoughts on Unimatrix Zero. What do you think of this episode? Please share your thoughts with me in the comments. If you'd like to support this channel, and I sure wish you would, if you can afford it, you can do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash steveshives, becoming a channel member by clicking the join button, or by making a one-time gift by clicking the thanks button or via PayPal or Venmo. Links are in the description. Please join me next week for another retro review. Next time, we wrap up this batch of reviews with a look at the one and only appearance of the Borg in Star Trek Enterprise, Regeneration. I'll see you next week for that. Thanks for watching, and take care, everybody.